Good morning, Melee. Hello, everyone. My name is Deer, and I'm joined here by Aiden McCaig. Uh, Aiden, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? I'm not yeah, sure what uh, titles you're going to go by right now. Yeah. I'm uh, Aiden McCaig, otherwise known as Calvin or or Eamon, I suppose now. And I currently work at Beyond the Summit as a product manager. Uh, but my last day is tomorrow. And uh, I'm going to be working at Mogul Moves uh, alongside Ludwig and Slime uh, to work on, uh, I guess, I'm, I'm technically the director of e-commerce now. Wow. That's, that's a pretty uh, Mogul move. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Big, wow. big jump, I guess. And um, yeah, I'm just, I've been a Smash TO for a long time since I joined the community at the end of 2013. Uh, probably most notably started endgame tv with uh, a couple other people and have run a bunch of events under that brand and then uh became like the smash to guy at beyond the summit once i joined the team there uh yeah that's fantastic um so yeah i'm gonna jump back to some of your history from your starts and your roots in the scene uh you and i have met quite a few years ago when I think I yeah. was in high school. I think I was in like grade 12 when I first attended one of your tournaments in Bellingham or you attended one of mine as well here. Um, so yeah, you've been organizing stuff in your local scene for some time. So what was your introduction to the Smash scene? Like how'd you get started? Yeah, uh, it's very it's very typical, I would say. So I got introduced uh, to the documentary <laughs> through the YouTube algorithm. Doc like I was just on YouTube. Yeah, I was just on YouTube. And uh, one of the first episodes of the documentary, or the first episode of the documentary, popped up on my YouTube like recommended page, and I just clicked on it. This is like November, like late November in 2013. Clicked on the doc, uh, was like confused at first because I thought it had to do with Smash, and it, uh, for some reason, like I remember clicking around in the episode and thinking like this seems kind of weird. And then I, I clicked over, I like went over and like just randomly clicked on the sixth episode, which I think is like the Korean DJ episode. And then I got a little more lost in the story of that one. And then I restarted the whole thing and like watched it all in one night. Uh, and that was kind of my, my first like interest or like introduction to the real competitive scene. Cause before that, like I, I just knew like loosely about like wave dashing and I would try to do it in like PM. Cause I, I thought mods were like cool like that. And then, um, yeah, after watching the doc, I got really like fired up. I joined Smashboards and I hosted a uh, I hosted a tournament for Melee and Project M in December of 2013 at my local library. I think 28 people showed up <laughs> and uh, so. that's how I kind of got got it all started. I think that was on like December 15th or December 16th in 2013. Um, and then from there, uh, you know, I joined the Facebook group through like the Washington Melee Smashboards thread. And, uh, and that's how I started to get more involved with like the local scene. Nice. That's fantastic, dude. Yeah. Um, I feel like uh, your events were like synonymous with Washington events. And so back then you were a really young kid in the community who was running the scene at that time and who were kind of like your the people you looked up to when you first got into the scene who kind of helped you get your, you know, get your reins. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the, the, the start for me was, I, I mean, the biggest TO, like who was running the biggest tournaments in Washington at the time was probably Chris Anderson, who known as the game clocks guy. Cause he ran the game clocks monthly as well as like Northwest majors, which were probably the biggest tournaments for smash or the fighting game community yep. in general at the time. And then, but I was a little further north in this area, like on the Canadian border. And like the biggest scene near me was uh, in Bellingham, Washington, mostly centered around uh, Western Washington University, which is like the, the biggest school up in that area. And uh, the first people that I met, like the first people I went to fest with were the, uh, the Western uh, Washington Smash Scenes Club. Like there, there's a club at the University for Smash. And they were the first people I played with. I got to know those guys. Um, my first big tournament I went to was probably Smash for Smiles. The uh, I think it was the first Smash for Smiles on the Western Washington University campus. 
And uh, I didn't help, like, I didn't do anything to run that yep. one. I just showed up with, like, setups and stuff. Like, I did everything I could to help. but You I were kinda, just, like, like, a supportive uh, community member, yeah? Yeah, supportive community member at the time. Uh, I was so funny because I, like, I brought, like, a small HDTV, and I was, like, I insisted, like, that it was fine to play on. But, of course, it wasn't. Uh, so it and, no uh, yeah, little things like that, right? And then uh, those were kind of the people that I got to know was, like, the club. Speci- specifically, David Lowry was probably the person who was the biggest, like, Bellingham guy at the time he signed, sort of led the club uh had fests things like that um and i got to know those guys like the bellingham scene and like uh was like my first introduction to the game and then i think from bellingham i started going to bc tournaments like soon after because like that was the probably the biggest events that were close to me were in vancouver or like in the lower mainland in general so i would like drive across the border when i was 16 and i would like drive to drive to tournaments there um um, and then that's sort of how I got introduced to the BC melee community. So those were probably like the two scenes that I like came up in, if you will, is like uh, the Bellingham melee scene and the uh, and the BC melee scene. Yep. Uh, so I really got to know a lot of people in in both of those. And then organizers in BC melee, they, they, a little with a little sketchier background at the time, were like the P4K ben Reese. guys and yeah. Ben Reese and people like that. He passed away. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, what? Yeah. For real? Yeah, yeah. I did not know yeah. that. That's uh, that's awful. Because that he awful. was, a, he, you know, he was a fun guy to be around. Yeah. So that's unfortunate to hear. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I want to say we were just talking about your starts, and you started off with a lot of Washington stuff. But if you do go to your Liquipedia page entry, it says Aiden, is, or sorry, Calvin rather, is a chic main from British Columbia, Canada. So what's the deal behind that? What's your relationship with BC? Are you from BC? Yeah, uh so basically I'm I'm Canadian. I'm also American now, but basically like uh I I was like born and like lived in Canada in like my early life. Um I'm originally from Kelowna, which is like the interior BC, like a little further east. Um and then my family like immigrated to the US like when I was uh in like er- like mid elementary school and then we moved back to Canada for a bit and then we moved to Washington when I was in middle school. Um, so that's kind of how that happened. So by the time I got into melee, which is like I, I was in, uh, I was in like tenth grade at the time, like the end of tenth grade. Um, by the time I got into the game, I was, or maybe the beginning of eleventh grade. Uh, so I, I can't remember quite quite well enough. But yeah, I'd been living in Washington for like years at that point. But we lived on the town that I lived in. It's called Linden, Washington. Uh, is like right on the Canadian border. Yep. Like we're five, like my parents' house is like five minutes away from the Canadian border. And like, I went over to Canada like all the time. Cause like, that's where all my family that aren't my parents lives. So like every, basically every other weekend for years of my life was spent road tripping to Kelowna to see the rest of my family and then road tripping back, uh, which is like a three and a half hour drive. Um, and then, so that's like my roots or like my connection to BC is like, I am Canadian, I guess. And then, uh, over the course of my entire life up until COVID, honestly, I think I go to Canada. Like, uh, I went to Canada like once every two months, at least, uh, up until like COVID hit. Uh, so that's kind of my connection to like Canada. And then my connection to BC melee was just like trying to attend tournaments there. Cause Seattle was way further, like to get to things that were the biggest tournaments in the Seattle area was like over a two hour drive each way. But to get into Vancouver from where I lived was like 45 to 50 minutes. So that was like way better. It's been really funny for me because when you used to come to my events, I'd always see you as like part of the Americans and you were always like, you know, the Americans who are out of region. And sometimes yeah. I see people laughing about how you're a Canadian and, you know, as the Canadian who'd be like, Oh, you're the American. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I always had that growing up with my Canadian friends. Like I would go back to like, I, I spent a lot of time in Calgary, like growing up too, because that's where a lot of my family lives. And my friends in Calgary always made fun of me. Like they, they like you dumb American or you fat American, like stereotypes about Americans, right? Yep. Just like jokes. And then uh, my my friends in like the States have always like made fun of the fact that I'm Canadian. So it's just like, a, it's just a back and forth thing. Uh, Cause I eventually like in, in 11th grade, or in, t- in sorry in 10th grade when i was 16 i i got naturalized like i became yep. a citizen here so uh you know dual nationality and i'm like 
I'm proud of You're it. Chilling. I like being yeah. Canadian and American, and uh, mm. I like having, and especially, I, I think it's really cool how that's like reflected through the way I came up in Melee because I had those like two country scenes like so close to me. Because yep. like I think for most people, like even if you're in Washington, if you were in Seattle, right, like BC is like a relatively far drive away. But having like having BC Melee, like if there was an Abbotsford tournament, for instance, like oh, Abbotsford so was literally literally a ten minute drive from my house. Like and <laughs> and uh. I would uh, so being a part of like both of those scenes, I feel like is a really unique experience that I think like uh, no other like players really took advantage of in the same way that I did. That's awesome to hear, man. Cool. So I think uh, the first events that really got a lot of traction outside of region and stuff and had a lot of more like a uh, bigger scale was when you started doing end game TV stuff. Is would, is that what you'd say? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think my first, like, big, big tournament that I ran, like, a Smash for Smiles 2, which I was in charge of, uh, that was my first, like, 100-plus tournament that I ran. Uh, but I would say, like, my first bigger regional tournament that was a lot more challenging to run was Emerald City 1, right. which was Endgame TV's first Smash event. And that was in January of 2016, after I'd moved down to Seattle for college at the University of Washington. And uh, I decided to get together with my friend Eric from the Mario Kart community, who lived in Boston at the time. Uh, and we were like, let's do Smash events under this brand you've created. Because he originally created Endgame TV for Mario Kart and right. Splatoon stuff. I and I was like, let's do, let's do Smash stuff. And, uh, and yeah, Emerald City 1 happened in January of 2016, like right at the beginning of, I, I would say right at the beginning of like Melee's peak, right. which is kind of in that 2016 to 2017 time frame. And uh, yeah, that event popped off. It, it had over 300 people. So, and for a Smash event at the time, uh, that was huge, yep. like in our region. That, that was absolutely ridiculous. Um, and uh, that's where things like really took off for me, I think, was pursuing that event. That's fantastic, man. Uh, how would you say that you were able to scale up so much from the stuff you were doing with Smash for Smiles? Like, what did you approach differently with Endgame TV? Um, like, was it the communication? Because I know you guys had uh, a pretty big team. Of, sorry, not a pretty big team, but your team was pretty spread out. It was in a lot of different places, right? Um, yeah, yeah. It was interesting because uh, it, it just really came from, like, latching on to people who I thought were, like, equally as interested and passionate as me in creating something, like, that was actually, like, good. Yep. So I, I had a huge ego at the time, undeservedly so. But basically, I saw the biggest tournaments in Washington at the time, and I'm like, these are terrible. Like, that was what I would tell myself and be like, I could just, like, fix all these things and do it myself because I was already interested in organizing and, like, making things happen. So the idea with Emerald City, it's like, we're going to fly a top player out. That's going to be a reason to come. Uh, we're going to have a lot of setups. The branding is going to be good. The yep. visual presentation of this is going to be good. And we're going to have a nice stream. And all of the – and the tournament is going to run well. Yep. Like, that that was my idea of, like, what could be a good tournament experience. And Eric was so on board that he was, like, down to – because he knew, like, production – better than I did and he was down to fly out for the first Emerald City from Boston to stream the event that's what we did he streamed it on like my PC I had and flew out to do it stayed on my dorm floor um and uh and then it just kind of grew from there as we like bumped into other people in the community that I saw were like passionate and driven in a very similar way I would reach out to them and I would be like hey do you want to do you want to join our team? Which mm -hmm. ended up the original people were like Contra from Oregon yep. and uh, and Silent Knight from Oregon, who became uh, Carter. aka Carter, mm -hmm. yeah, who became like our main production because like uh, Iric flying out every time from Massachusetts yeah. was kind of like an unsustainable practice, um, and uh, yeah, that's how the team like initially developed was like uh, you know young people in college who wanted to do cool stuff and like uh, and didn't care that much about the money. And I feel like that was like the fuel that started the fire, which was like all those Endgame TV events initially. For sure. And so what time period was this exactly? And like how old were you around then? You mentioned uh, UW earlier, right? Were you in UW yeah. at the time then? So this was your college yeah. years? Yeah. So because Emerald City was on UW's campus, interestingly enough, I found a great venue literally across the street from my dorm on campus called the Intellectual House, which uh, they put up with a lot of shit in my inexperience in being able to run an event of this scale. They yep. they made it really cheap. Uh, we ran late the first two Emerald Cities and they like tolerated the mistakes and like worked with us to fix them. Yep. Uh, a really fantastic team over there. The Intellectual House, I credit with the opportunity they gave me and the team is basically the whole reason I became who I am today. Like um, I, the people over there are really wonderful people 
and the fact that they gave us the opportunity to run these events in a space that wasn't really meant for gaming tournaments. It's more about like, uh, I would say like they provide their space for like a lot of on-campus events and specifically a lot of like uh, events for, for Native American students. And for them to give us the opportunity to use that space for our purposes at the price they did was so, so generous of them. And the fact that they worked with us to fix the problems and make sure that we could run on time and could continue using this space, I really, really appreciate in retrospect. Because without them, I don't think, I, I don't even know if I would like be here. Um, and uh, yeah, those, I was 18 at the time when we got this started. Um, so that was, uh, yeah, 18 at the beginning of 2016, end of 2015, which is like when the wheels started turning. That's really cool to hear, man. Um, so you continued to continue and grow with um, Endgame TV and Don't Park on the Grass. Um, when did you come up with the idea for Don't Park on the Grass? Did you start Endgame TV knowing you'd eventually run this major that would become so iconic or... Yeah, that was like loosely the goal, I think. The idea was to start with like a, a monthly. The reality is Emerald City never became a monthly. It was just more like a quarterly regional almost. Yeah. Um, or like where we'd do it like three to four times a year. Or at least that's what we were aiming for at the time. And the idea was like we would cap it off with like a major that could like offer what Northwest majors couldn't at the time, which was like our largest tournament that we had. And I wanted to like run a smash focused tournament that was really good and really unique in like a space on the UW campus in Seattle in like a better location um, and, and run a really big tournament. And a really big tournament to me at the time was like, let's run something that hits between like 400 and 600 people. And we started planning this in like March, April of 2016, which is like uh, a little after Emerald City got started. And then by the time the event came to like full fruition, um, you know, in December later of that year, it, it had exploded. The event um, hit had over 1,200 people, including uh, the spectators. I think it was like 1,100 competitors and then like 150 peer spectators, um, which was way, way bigger than I ever had imagined at the time. And that was a big deal for me at like 19 and of a team of people who was all basically under the age of 20. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think as far as I know, I've looked into this, as far as I know, I'm the youngest person ever to host an esports tournament uh, with over a thousand people. True. I, this is I, as far as I can tell. I think that's a fair um, record. Yeah. Battle BC's never hit a thousand back in the day. And I can't think of any other organizers who were, yeah, that's sick. Yeah. It's something I'm still like really proud of in retrospect. I think like, like a lot of things in that year with Emerald city, don't park in the grass needed a lot of help from other people who stepped up to make sure that the event like stayed together. And the reality is I didn't have the knowledge to execute those type of events all by myself at the time. Like I, I really didn't. And uh, without all the help along the way um, and, and a kind of a check to my ego, it's like, it never would have been possible yeah. without like the end game TV team, the UW smash guys, like all the people that stepped up to provide resources and time to make sure those events could run. Cause yeah. eventually they, I mean, they all turned out really well in the end, I think. Um, but I think a lot of the pressure and like the work I put on myself, I ultimately like wouldn't have delivered without their help. And I'm really, really thankful for that because I, I didn't have the knowledge to run events of this scale at the time. It was like very much trial by fire and it just like all worked out. Yeah, no, for sure. There are so many people who in events like this who do just like, they're like, hey, let me just help you succeed. And uh, I think a lot of those people are behind the scenes in the community. They're not necessarily the ones who are out there. So like shout outs like Lewis, for example, who provides all of yeah. the stream production equipment to so many people and like sports scenes like that. Yeah super beneficial yeah so, yeah i think that's actually a huge shout out lewis who provided like major production <laughs> equipment to the pacific northwest for years yeah. with uh, with no pay just like had stuff that he gave people and then also tuck smash for those like years when uh mike lau basically saved the stream and production at the first dome park in the grass with the quad stream yep there's a bunch of individual like little stories and little heroes that sort of like build up the scene and bring everything together over the years and it's it's you know it's much more than me who like did these things and, and it's, I, I think it's important to reflect on that it's really crazy to be seeing this you know six years later now seven years later now that like some of those people are still around and they're still just doing cool stuff and all of us have kind of really grown up so much since then and these were all you know when you look back at how much has happened in those six seven years it's understand like yeah. it's insane right i feel like we've 
we've really grown up over these years. So speaking of growing up, your first grown up job in esports was it at Smash GG when you started working there? Because at one point you were like eight in from Smash GG kind of thing. I remember yeah. feeling like I'd always think about you and Smash GG was it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that happened in that same year, the beginning of 2016. Basically, I was looking for internships at the time because uh, I really needed one. I, I I was on kind of an accelerated path with college where like my first year in university was actually like my third year. And uh, I really needed an uh, a, like a junior year internship. Uh, and uh, while I'm working on these events, I'm also trying to land something in like finance, something, you know, that I would have inevitably hated. Uh and uh, in April of 2016, I, I was on a call with Sean, who, who was the CEO of Smash GG at the time. And uh, he was telling me about like new features on their site. And I was an early adopter of Smash GG. I'd been using it since August of 2015 for, for like a regional that I ran. And, uh, and Smash GG was like, a, I was like one of the first people like using that for like larger tournaments. And uh he was like, explaining all these new features and then at the end of the call he just like spitballs something he's like yo we're gonna have like internships and i'm like oh that sounds great like please let me know when like the application is up and he did and then i applied um and i interviewed and ended up getting it alongside uh the two partner success interns at smash gg were me and leah who a lot of people know and it was funny because we were both from uw and it was like pure coincidence that we both went to the same school and both got hired uh, but anyway, ended up moving down to like NorCal for that summer for that internship where I lived in like Berkeley for a summer, um, worked at Smash GG as an intern full time. And then uh, when the internship was over and I had to go back to school, I asked them, I was like, a lot of this work, I think I can do part time for you guys. Is, would that be all right? Like, can I work remotely? And they were like, yeah. And then they basically also promised me a full time job, you wow. know, provided uh, as long as I was like stayed good at my job. Uh, they promised me a full-time job after I graduated. So I kept doing Smash GG part-time uh, through the following year of school until I graduated, and then I started full-time in uh, the summer of 2017. That's fantastic, man. Are there any big highlights you have from your time at Smash? Like, Smash GG was your first time probably working in an organization that wasn't really yours, right? I mean, you had, but like you were not the head honcho of this, and you were working in an act it's like a, it was a company for profit you know with goals yeah. and everything it was like a very big deal um were there lessons that you learned there that you were able to apply to endgame tv at that time because endgame tv and smash gg were simultaneous right how do you think yeah. it helped with your growth in endgame tv to be on kind of both sides there yeah, that's that's an interesting question. I, I I don't think I've ever really thought about that honestly. But looking back now, I think one of the big things is like I could see. I think like there were all, there were frustrations with leadership at Smash GG that I made sure I tr didn't replicate in the end game TV environment. Mm -hmm. And end game TV is like you know a lot more scaled down, less money at stake. Um, but I think a big thing was like always letting people who are a part of the staff or a part of the leads at Endgame TV uh, have have a weight in decision making and how we handled things. And that was like really, really important and having people's opinions be respected. And not that that didn't happen at Smash GG, but I feel like a lot of things at Smash GG over time were sort of like out of the lower people's control. Mm. And I didn't like that feeling. And I tried to like make sure I didn't do that as like the leader or like as the owner at Endgame TV. Um, that that's probably the first thing that comes to mind um and then the small things like like just how to how to work in like a in a tech business environment yeah. like small skills or like small just small things you know you that you learn apply to pretty much everything you do helps fuel and like build your professional experience cool um i think i remember running into you working as a smash gg representative at were you at canada cup in toronto uh, I was. Yeah, I do remember. I bought a hoodie from you there. Um, yeah. Tell me about what it was like to travel for Smash GG because you were at events repping Smash GG. I remember meeting the Smash GG team at like Genesis and I got like so much free swag. I used to love like the booths giving out free yeah. stuff at events. I mean, who does In 2016 and 2017 and 2015 a bit before I got hired, like 2016 and 27 specifically, 2017 specifically though, like we would travel to a lot of events and we do like the Smash GG booth and like we would 
uh, just like do various pop ups at tournaments and things. That became less frequent over time because I think it was realized that it wasn't like the most valuable thing we could be doing. But I loved traveling that summer because it was like the permission to travel to these events that were like on our platform and to like uh, basically validate it as work. It gave me uh the opportunity to see so many things it was like one of the first summers i really like traveled a ton which is like really really important to me just individually um and i ended up going to a lot of tournaments like that was the first time i went to air that was air three that summer i went to di another day too in perth uh perth australia Mm -hmm. um i went to like canada cup i went to shine i went to tournaments literally all over the country and world Mm -hmm. and then i kept doing that for years after and it sort of set this precedent of like how I would live my life going forward, which is, of course, very lucky and a, a very privileged, but something that shaped shaped the way I think like I integrated into the scene because like I, I think something that I really value is like the friends that I've made everywhere and uh, the connections that I have in this scene uh, that are really, really important to me that will stick with me, like whether I'm playing Smash or not. And th- that summer was like the building block of it all. Like, especially EU Melee, I think that was the, as someone who has, like, a really close relationship with, I think, a lot of EU Melee, that summer was sort of the start of that, where I really got to know a lot of those guys better. Yeah, I think one of the things that people who aren't in the Smash community, uh, until you get to experience it, you don't really understand, but the camaraderie, like, whenever you, uh, you meet someone and you're out of region, like, you travel to another region and they hear you traveled from somewhere for this event, their eyes just light up, they're like, yeah. yo, you're instantly their best friend, and they'll just do everything they can to make you feel like you're a part of their scene, and it just it just goes such a long way, and uh, yeah, it's it's opened the, it's created these amazing relationships like that are lifelong at this point for people that you know it's difficult to meet people in any other context and have that kind of a click other than if you're like yeah I don't know like drunk at a bar then you meet someone they're suddenly your best friend but like even yeah. that it's like. Yeah. It's not the same. It's not the same. I, I, I think there are so many opportunities where like are so many stories that would like reflect this really well. But I, I one I really like is I went to I was going to a tournament in Norway and this was in twenty nineteen. And uh on my way to the city in Norway that it was in or near, uh I stopped in Oslo for a night and I had to stay there for like a day basically. And uh, I just hit up the Norwegian like melee Facebook group, and I was like, "Can anybody house me for a night?" And this dude, like, or uh, sorry, more than one person reached out, but ended up what ended up happening is one of them who had offered his apartment wasn't even staying in Norway at the time. He was on a trip in the states, and he's like, "You can just have my apartment for the weekend, <laughs> yeah. or like whatever time you need, and you can stay in it as long as you like water my plant and change the sheets." <laughs> and I was like, "Holy shit, man! Yeah, of course." And I did that, and like. I think part of that is understanding the culture of it all and like returning the favor. And uh, there's so many small instances of stuff like that where people as a part of this like culture of the game are just like willing to do extraordinary things like that, that you would normally never get out of like another hobby or fandom, which I really, really appreciate. Hmm. I'm really hoping that as we return to like this, this past year and a half or so has been a really big, difference in that and we haven't been able to experience that as much and yeah. you know there's been a lot more negativity in the scene and there's been a lot of really tough events for people so i'm really hoping that as we like come back into this world that we're able to figure out how we can have a sustainable scalable scene which has this this beauty of everybody is a passionate community and respectful and loves each other kind of thing yeah yeah. Totally agree. Cool. So while you were at Smash GG, when did BTS become something that's on your radar? Because I think that was your next big step. Yeah, yeah. I think it was the beginning of 2019. I think uh, for for reasons that are sort of complicated, I was getting really fatigued by my job at Smash GG. It like, wasn't fun anymore. Um, I was not, like, I did not enjoy my yeah. work. It was, like, really frustrating. And I sort of checked out. Yeah. Um, during this time period. And one one of the things I did is I started talking to some of the guys at BTS more because I knew they were trying to get events on their channel. But I knew that the people at BTS didn't necessarily have the connections that I did with the Melee scene. And I was like, I will help you get events on your channel uh, for like a cut or like a rate. Um, 
And uh, I started doing that for them while I was at Smash GG still and while I was sort of looking for a way out because uh, I was, like, applying to other jobs um, and interviewing a couple places. And then um, ended up, like, uh, I guess, like, not locking something down with BTS, but had a pretty good idea that it could, like, go somewhere. Um, and I ended up leaving, uh, leaving Smash GG uh like sort of taking the summer off and then i started at bts in september of 2019 uh doing uh like basically what i was doing before like doing more smash work to get events on their channel but also like project management work and then management of like uh the smash events specifically at the company um and i got to start there and that was great because like those uh it was really nice to have like those relationships i started building at smash gg with bts like sort of transformed into something very like concrete and fun and cool because the, the people at bts are absolutely wonderful everybody there is like so cool to work with it's such a nice and unique like work environment um and they're a really really fantastic company that like uh i know i mentioned i'm like leaving but it's you know it, it's not because of any problem at bts like this is one of the best jobs i mean it's the best job i've ever had um so that's fantastic to hear so for a lot of the people in the community i mean this this podcast right now is on bts so if you're watching this you already are familiar with bts but a lot of people see bts they don't really know uh behind the scenes they know a couple faces and names you know ken yeah. you know you there was slime in the past uh th there's people involved with bts but uh, the inner workings of bts people don't how how big is bts and you know how does something like smash summit happen uh, it's such a huge thing yeah how many people are at yeah. bts the company so the company isn't as big as like and corporate as like some people seem to think it is it's like if i had to i actually don't know the exact number but i think it's like 30 to 40 people total and that's split between two offices so there's like the the main office in socal uh, where like most of the employees are, and then there is our Budapest office with the, which is like where our like programming and graphics team is wow. in Hungary. Um, so that's uh, that's kind of the split of the company. And then to put an event together like this, there's like a project manager uh, who I would be sometimes, or for a lot of the summits, it's uh, JJ, who some people might be familiar with, and she she's PM'd a lot of the uh, Smash summits. And then uh, there's, like, a head of broadcast. There's a head of, like, creative uh, who's, like, leading all the, like, compendium execution and, uh, in like, sketch writing and stuff like that. And then, like, a content lead who's helping, like, film all the sketches and plan those out. Um, and then, like, the actual editing of the sketches. The production, like, team is, like, a, a huge part of every event. Probably, like, the actual machine that makes every event go is certainly the production team. And they have to do a ton of planning for every event because every event is a little different in its execution. Um, and uh, all of those teams sort of, like, come... And then, and then of course, there's, like, the sales team, the HR yeah. team, the hospitality team. Like, I can't... Hospitality is, like, Such a big pretty thing. much the the machine of the, the on-site ship, where, like, hospitality handles every, like, need of the players over the course of the weekend and make sure everything runs well in person. Um, and then, like, HR and sales are fulfilling their own duties with each event. So, like, there's there's all these different teams within the company that have a part to play in each event that we do. And then the PM is sort of overseeing it all and making sure that those teams are communicating with each other and are ready for the event weekend. Um, so there's, there's just a ton of, like, moving pieces. Like, the amount, like, there are so many people that have so much work to do for yep. each summit. It's, like, not just this 16-person thing in a house that, like, is, like, kind of easy to get together right these are like expensive yep. long hour events that are like really really difficult to produce and uh they're they, they you know they're extraordinary in their uh style and like how they represent the company and you know the identity we've been able to carve over the years is really impressive and like for those who don't know maybe maybe people are like familiar with dota but the company is like founded and owned by uh ld and uh but gods who are like more embedded in like or, or were more embedded in the dota scene and like those guys kind of like oversee everything especially ld like gods is super invested in like the dota side of the company which is huge like dota is like a huge cornerstone of bts's success even now and uh smash summits like are just a small part of this like overall uh, bigger pie that like dota is probably the largest chunk of 
Um, and then LD kind of like oversees everything, like, you know, whether it be like a Counter-Strike event or a Rocket League event or a Fortnite event, like we've done a ton of different games over the years. And like, I've had the opportunity to work on a bunch of projects for other games through this company as well, which I really loved because uh, like, I've always been super invested in Smash, but my love of esports like pre mm -hmm. preceded that. And I wanted, I always wanted to be involved in esports in general, yep. which is a big part of like why BTS has been so, so great. Yeah, no, that makes sense. What other esports events did you did you work? Do you have any particular favorites, um, or like one that yeah. just, comes to mind? So the standouts for me. Um, so last summer in 2020, I got to run this event called Ninja Battles, which was a ninja branded Fortnite event what? series, which sounds super like cheesy, yeah. but it was awesome to run. I I met all these like top Fortnite players through it. I got wow. to like run that event um, and be. A be in a part in this like recurring series become like friends with them uh way greater appreciation for like how competitive fortnite actually works because i feel like it's sad you bro like your brother is a lot your brother's into yeah. fortnite right he used to be he was like he has made a few thousand on a plane fortnite he's actually really good i think but, i saw that and, tweet yeah <laughs> yeah and he uh and uh, yeah, getting more involved in like a scene that he cared about was really cool. And then also our tournament really stood out in like its format compared to like a lot of the epic sponsored events. So I really liked that as well. We ran event an event that like a lot of the top players said was like one of the best run events that they've ever played in. So that was like really cool because I had never run anything in Fortnite before that. Um, and then the other event that stood out is probably CS Summit 7. So like I love Counter-Strike and I've always wanted to run a Counter-Strike event and CS Summit 7 albeit of course with help uh across the company was an event that i got to run and i'm super proud of that because counter-strike is just something that's you know near and dear to my heart and uh the fact that i finally got to run like a two hundred thousand dollar counter-strike event like i was so proud of that so yeah it's been it's been an awesome learning experience with like a lot of highlights along the way that's awesome man so uh you ran uh multiple summits then you were saying um with, so which was your what was your first summit that you ran I think the as first the project one that was like uh smash summit nine mm -hmm. it was sort of like split because it was sort of like one that uh, jj was like also doing and she took like the lead on it because it was like my first in-person summit and then the first one the first event i think or the first summit that i did beginning to end on my own mm -hmm. was smash summit 10 which was online albeit but it pretty much like had you know the majority of the components on the planning side of what you would have to do for like an offline one, albeit uh, certainly not the same scope of work, uh, but but similar. And then, uh, yeah, I think I think Smash Summit ten, and then CS Summit seven, and then CS Summit eight, and then uh, now uh, now Smash Summit eleven, I guess, which was also like uh, JJ was also deeply involved in Smash Summit eleven because I'm I was leaving right after. <laughs> gotcha. Cool. Um, so with Summit 11, just having come to wrap last weekend, huge success, man. Congratulations to you and your team. That was an incredible event. And that grand finals was one that, I mean, I've already rewatched it like twice. I think yeah. it's uh, a set for the books. Um, yeah, insane. Yeah. For, so any, so hmm, what are some of the unique challenges or things you had to think about for this summit that you weren't really expecting uh or that were like particularly like huge new challenges tell me about it because of the way the world is at the moment yeah all the visa stuff for starters with like left and pipsqueak was a nightmare and it was so much more work than i think any of us could have really planned for uh like we were hoping like when we invited them initially that like vaccinations would have been like escalated by that point that a lot of the travel restrictions would be out of the way but unfortunately by the time we got to the event they weren't and then we did a lot of work to try to get them into the country, like both of them, uh, you know, speaking with like uh, immigration lawyers and uh, to producing a lot of like paperwork and like letters to try to convince like the embassy to like to let them come. Mm -hmm. uh, they both had different situations. Like there's a reason Pipsqueak tried to go and went through Mexico and like left and didn't do that. Yeah. Their situations are not the same, to be clear. Uh, but like just helping both of them out and like tr putting a bunch of hours into that in advance of the event and during the event because that's when Pipsqueak stuff really shit yeah. like, when his shit hit the fan. Uh, 
that was, you know, an extraordinary amount of work and a challenge that we don't normally deal with and is very COVID specific. Um, and I think other than that, there was sort of just like a lot of like safety and like agreement paperwork that went along with this event that you don't normally have to produce if like we were in normal times. Mm -hmm. um, Cause we had to make sure that everybody in the event was like vaccinated and good to go with the exception of, I think, with the exception of AMSA, who I think had only had one shot, um, who, yeah, everybody else had to be like fully vaccinated. Uh, and that was like a process that we had to go through and a lot of like paperwork and time that just has to be dealt with in order to host an event like this safely, I think. <laughs> yeah, for sure, man. But uh, hey, it, it did come together. There were there were a lot yeah. of things that didn't, but in the end, the event did come together and Pipsqueak will be at the next Smash Summit for sure. Hopefully Leffen as well. So all that situation, you know, yeah. it sucks, but yeah. Congrats on that. Um, so I was thinking, with an event like Smash Summit, it's a very unique event in the community in the place that it holds. It's able to maximize across the board. You know, it lo it's like level ten across the board in terms of yeah. the attendee experience is like catered as much as it can be to an be an amazing attendee experience, and uh, the viewer experience is as premium as it will get. It, it is the top of the bar. It's at the summit. Um, but that's obviously not replicable in a bigger, like a di different styles of events, right? We do have major scale events. And I know main stage is one of the events that you're working on uh, that is coming up soon. Um, registration is also open now. <laughs> we'll make sure we plug that in there. So how do you approach an event like main stage philosophy wise uh, versus an event like summit? Like what are you thinking about there? How can you please all your stakeholders at an event like main stage because the stakeholders of the spectators the viewers the bar is really really different and attendees the bar is really really different um for an event like like main stage yeah i i think there's just this shift in priority between the two where uh you know, the majority or like a large portion of the revenue for an event like main stage is based around the ticket sales. And you have to like emphasize aspects of the event and market aspects of the event that are more valuable to the people that are going to attend the tournament and shaping an event that is like really a memorable experience for the people that do come. Uh, and that's what that is like more focused on, I would say, while not necessarily sacrificing stream stuff, but the stream presentation and the schedule is naturally going to be different for an event like that. Uh, whereas like summit is more about uh, while we maximize or like do what we can for like all of the players comfort and the attendee experience. And like, you know, we give food and like the event is like relatively well run and like all those things. It is much more focused on the viewer experience mm. because the viewership aspect of it and the sponsorship aspect of it are so important in like making sure that event is viable. Mm -hmm. So you sort of have to like shift your focus to different not that all of these parties aren't involved in some way in all of these events, but like the priority of those mm. people shift based off of like how you fund and make the event happen. Um, so I would say those are the main differences is just like with main stage, it's, it's more focused about like selling tickets and doing what we can to sell tickets uh, with smash Summit, It's more about like creating something memorable, fun to watch and maximizes viewership. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So for, um, the tournament organizers out there that who are on a smaller scale, what do you think they should be thinking about there as events are starting to come back and, uh, you know, as COVID restrictions ease up in the world, what are you hoping to see uh, happen in events? Um, or should, you don't have to spoil too much because I know you do have events in the pipeline. I'm really excited to see what happens with those for sure. Um, but yeah, feel free to share how you feel there. I think it's tough. Uh, I think locals, like, I think, uh, to be clear, one one thing is I came up at a really good time in Melee's history. I had a lot of, like, I think there's this saying, it's like, uh, success is sort of like where, where skill meets opportunity. And I had a lot of opportunity that I could capitalize on uh, because it was given to me. And when one of those big things is I was just TOing and getting into all this when like Melee was really on the upswing and you could like really capitalize on the game, like being 
uh, huge. And now I think we are in an upswing in it in its own right, where like the the game is growing uh, in a player base and a viewership sort of way. Like we're back on the up and up, but we're in a different time where like net play is more prevalent and like playing online is like more of the culture. So when you host events for like in-person people, it, there might be challenges that like I didn't have to deal with because like net play wasn't huge. And like, mm-hmm. we were sort of just in this massive swing from the documentary and everything else that had happened in 2014, 2013, sort of that sort of period. Um, and I would keep that in mind. I don't have all the answers and like the advice to like become successful in the modern age. I, um, however, I think the few things you do have to think about have to do with like selling your tournament or your local over like staying at home and playing net play. Mm-hmm. What can you offer that differentiates your tournament and makes it worth driving like thirty minutes to um, instead of just sitting at home and playing like an hour of net play. Um, and that for me, like that is formatting your tournament in a way that makes sure everybody gets more than like two sets. Um, making sure everybody has an opportunity to play for like a long period of time, get in a lot of matches while we're there, make it worth their money. Um, and I think, uh, outside of that, I think a really successful or like a really important part of success in building a local tournament series or a local scene is providing that, and helping build that sense of community. That's actually something that I don't think I focused on well enough in hindsight. I was not particularly good at that. I was more concerned with like upping my scale of the tournaments I ran rather than like the, the fun and camaraderie at the tournaments, tournaments themselves. Um, and I think like there are scenes who have sort of managed to edge out the overall trends of melee attendance by having that type of scene, uh, like Melbourne melee, in Australia comes to mind specifically. Their scene has like uh, hasn't shrunk that much or has debatably even grown in tough areas for the game in the past few years because they have such a level of like friendship and camaraderie in that scene that people desire to be a part of. Um, and I think that's what people should aim for as well. It's like make your tournament value in a tournament sense, but also make it fun to go to, a place where people can make friends and spend spend good time with other people. Yeah, it's really awesome to hear it from you, and it's hopefully really insightful for the viewers who might be on the who are likely on the other side, where they are the player who's sitting there, you know, playing slippy and debating whether or not they're it's worth their time to take the twenty man drive to their local and support the yeah. event. You know, really important. Um, so while you're at BTS, is when you probably got to know Slime. Is that the case? Like you guys were coworkers. Or how yeah, did... I knew him before uh-huh. a bit. So, like, we had met... Um, I can't remember the first event I met him at exactly. Like, I know... I, I think it may have been Pat's house. That was the first event I met Ludwig at, but I feel like I may have met Slime before that, too. Um, but uh, we just, like, had chatted here and there over the years about, like, tournaments or, like, when Melee we... Melee acquaintance, right? Yeah. Yeah, but we didn't know each other well. And then I think the first time we really got to spend time with each other was... Probably, probably Bam in Melbourne. So he actually went to Bam in 2018, uh, in May. I think it was May of 2018, and I went to that event on my own. He went to that event on his own, and then we just kind of like hung out at like a bar one night and like chatted and like got to know each other a bit better there. And then uh, I started talking to him more through my work at Smash GG and like working on Smash Summits from the Smash GG side. Um, so that's how we just like started talking. And then uh, the summer before I moved in with them, I started playing like Counter Strike more with Slime and like some of the other friends, uh, a lot of like bad melee uh, people. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's kind of like how we got to know each other. And they became way better friends once I like moved in with them and like we're coworkers. Obviously, have spent a lot of time together at this point. <laughs> Did you move in with him because you were going to go work at BTS? Was that the arrangement? Yeah, yeah. Like, I was looking for roommates, and I was, like, primarily looking for people I would know through Smash that I might be able to move in with. And, like, I hit him up and to see if there was any shot of, like, moving in with him, Nick, and Ludwig, because I just knew them, like, vaguely, and I figured it'd be cool and convenient, and I was just, like, down to move in with people. Um, And then uh, it eventually ended up working out. They wanted to move into a new house, and they included me in the group, and then we found a place for all four of us. Nice. That's fantastic, man. It's just uh, the the note about you living with people is making me think about the one the, the time I spent a night at your uh, your door the frat house style that you lived in back in Seattle. Yes. I remember showing up and your barbecue was chained. 
to your fence, I think. And yeah. there's just beer bottles everywhere. Um, I have a really fun photo. Yeah, I woke up with... Yeah, I remember that one. The vodka, the gnome, and the oatmeal all side by side. Um, and no... no uh, all the mattresses on the ground. That was also... <laughs> but that was a fun time it was it was great so crazy crazy times in that house it's uh i do miss that house a lot that's some of my best friends lived in that house with me so i miss that i miss that time very much it was a good time man and so um from summit now you're making your next steps naturally you're living in the house with ludwig and slime and nick as you had said and as they're continuing to grow and ludwig is continuing to pop off i'm sure that it now you just get you know you can't not be involved in some way when you're living there right what was that like for you were you like hey i'm gonna become a part of this or i'm considering moving or how like what was how how'd that work out for you you mean getting involved in like ludwig stuff yeah or like mogul move stuff since i moved in yeah basically you know, like when did you start becoming involved with ludwig i guess you're now officially starting to be but you've always been like since living there involved with ludwig or maybe sure. not okay. or maybe okay. not. I, see. I see what you mean um yeah. i mean just as his i think just as his roommates and like as he kept streaming and becoming bigger like he would just like need people for things or bits or or stuff on his channel you know and like we were all down to participate like it was fun um it still is fun uh to be like a part of like random videos and things like that and that was the beginning and like that was it it was just like ludwig needs like somebody to help him with like something for his stream and then we would be a part of it and that was kind of it we just became you know we just hang out every day and then sometimes it's like for something on stream and that's kind of the end of the story and then um, as time went by, uh, Slime eventually decided to leave BTS and, like, pitched Ludwig on this concept of, like, being his manager and, like, being his go-to guy because Ludwig was growing a lot and needed somebody to, like, handle all, a lot of the, the business side of things mm -hmm. for him personally. And then that's kind of, like, when Slime jumped ship last year, um, like, in May, uh, May of 2020. Um, and then... Uh, Ludwig has had this idea for like a merch company of sorts that, you know, expands beyond his own merch and goes into the idea of like designing and selling merch for like other influencers. And uh, I always thought that idea was really good. Like the way he explained it and the execution behind it, I had a lot of faith in the concept and I was always very interested in it. And then um, about a month ago or like a month and a half ago, this conversation comes up of him like finally pursuing it a bit more doggedly and uh, I talked to him in Slime, and I was like, I think I could do this for you guys. Like, I think I want to do this. Um, and uh, I, I got to chatting, got to talking about how it would work. And then uh, that's when, like, I more officially joined on as, like, a member of, like, this company, I guess. Uh, but before that, and, like, moving in, especially in the first year, it was, like, never anything official. We were just, like, roommates helping our roommate and, like, friend out with, like, things he wanted to do on his stream, and that was it. That's super fun, man. So now you're super excited for your role with uh, Ludwig, but you also mentioned that you, in your Twitter about um, you're taking some steps back from TOing. You do have a couple of projects in the pipeline. Um, before we do wrap things up here, do you want us to talk a little bit about what the next steps look like for you and you know what, yeah, what you're excited to be working on soon? Yeah, I, I think the, the main things is, like, I, I think I'm just, like, a little burnt out with the Smash community organization in general. I think, like, as you be grow as a TO, you inevitably take on aspects of responsibility that don't have to do with specific events, but more have to do with, like, overarching community things. And I kind of want to leave that behind. I'm also really leaving behind, like, uh, pursuing projects uh, in my, like, personal life or, like, under Endgame TV. I don't really have, like, a drive to do those things anymore. Um and uh, I think in general, like, the more I kind of learned about the industry and the more I, like, did work in it, I think, like, I'm a little jaded about esports in general, and I just want to kind of move away from it and uh, try something new. And then, you know, it doesn't mean I'm gone forever. I think, like, esports is still great in a lot of ways, and maybe I'll go back to it um, after some time. But for now, I want to I wanna get some space from it. Yep. Um, and, uh, and then what i'm working on now like uh for i'm still being like contracted out for some smash events in the future bts specifically has me on for uh two to three smash events at least in like the rest of this year 
And then, uh, you know, as other opportunities may come my way, I could like say yes to those things as well. I think like the main thing I like about that is like being paid well for my work and then keeping it to one weekend is like really appealing. I just don't want to be thinking or dealing with it all the time, which is kind of what I'm trying to escape. Um, and then, uh, you know, obviously Ludwig has his own tournament series that he's run for Melee and, you know, aspirations that pull in a lot of different directions. And, uh, you know, if tournaments were to come up in, like, the mogul moves environment, I'd be happy to, like, take those things on uh, under this new job. But there's no, like, official plans for anything like that. I just think it's something that could be in the future or, like, in the cards for us. Cool. Yeah, makes sense. Um it's all really exciting stuff. I'm really uh, grateful that we had the chance to talk to you today. I got to learn so much more about you, and I hope the people watching this were able to um, also just understand how much you've put into this community, the amount of work you you do, and that what goes on behind it, like just how much goes on behind the scenes, right? Um, I really admire when I do see you talk, engaging with people who are just being assholes for no reason on your stuff and you take the time to like talk to them sometimes it it, yeah. it it makes me think it's like yeah it got me thinking that the people on the other side it's they're not just a bot right it's a person who has taken the time to say that kind of stuff and so that person is trying to be in our community and i appreciate you know you talking to them and telling them hey it's not okay yeah, to be an asshole that's the that's what I try to do, actually. Like, I'm I'm a bit of a reply guy sometimes, and I'm, like, working on it as, like, the amount of replies becomes kind of, like, unsustainable to reply to at every individual instance. But I think there are certain cases, especially when it comes to, like, tournaments, where, like, s people say dumb shit, and I'm, like, I confront them, and I'll be, like, L let's talk about this. Let's actually, like, poke holes in what you're saying. And then they usually have nothing more to say after. Like, they everybody, like, backs down. Um, but it was funny because like one of these scenarios actually manifested into like a whole discord call with a dude where like, I think I replied to like some scrub quotes post once. And then this dude was like mad at like my response. And then we got into like a Twitter thread argument and I was like, you can just like call me and I will talk this out with you. And then we did. And he like turned it on into a show on his stream. And it was like really fun. And it's like the idea. And I think we found a lot of common ground and it's really funny because a lot of those people who just fire off something dumb, are you like, you know, they actually are more thoughtful, but you just, like, need to give them, like, the time to, like, figure out what they actually mean. And I think, like, confronting people on that and forcing people to actually, like, think more about the conclusions they're coming to um, is, like, a good thing if you have time to do it. And I, I kind of, like, enjoy sticking it to somebody if, like, they don't have anything good to say, too. So I get I get a lot out of it, like, both ways, I guess. <laughs> and that's, you know, that's that's one of the huge negatives, I think, of, like, the Twitter space and Smash... Sorry, not Smash G, but Twitch chat as well, is that people just fire shit out into the void without realizing that there's other people on the other side who are real people and, Absolutely. you know the effects that it has on them. So yeah, it's really important for people to think about that. Um, all right, last question I've been asking everybody. Uh, I previously used to phrase it as, describe what Melee means to you in three words, or like three words about Melee. Yeah. Um, three words, man. Does it, it doesn't have to be a sentence, right? It doesn't it have to be, be three a sentence. Words. It does not. Oh. Uh, camaraderie, beautiful, expressive. I cool. think those are the three words that I think come to mind and sort of touch on the three different aspects of Melee that I think are really important. Like camaraderie being like the community aspect that we I think we all really cherish. Uh, the beauty of the game, like watching it play out and like learning all the little things that make it so unique and so enjoyable and expressive, like playing it yourself and like carving out your own play style, carving out your own way to play the game and communicate with the other player on the screen with you. I think that's, uh, those are all kind of like the, the pillars, I think, of like what makes the game great. I'm so glad to hear it, man. I agree completely. Thank you so much, Aiden. It was great chatting with you. Uh, best luck on your next adventures at Mogul Moves. And uh, yeah, thank you everybody for supporting the event and watching. I hope you have a great rest of your night enjoying Gallant Melee Open Summer Edition. Bye now.